call the Christ. The title of today's talk is Freedom Through Christ, and uh, I've been talking about a freedom for June and into July, uh, various aspects of freedom. Last week we talked about freedom through authenticity and vulnerability and courage, and I made a comment that I want to clarify today. I said that the Fillmores were about finding commonality in whatever conversations they are having, and they absolutely are. And my comment was that I no longer necessarily totally agreed with that, um, and that we need to step up and we need to stand up for what is right when we bear witness to exclusivity and separation. So I want to share with you, I still believe in finding commonality, <laughs> but um, as I said last week, it is time for us to speak this message and to speak it with our lives and to speak it out loud, especially when we are, are somewhere where we see that someone is not being treated where there are injustices. Now I know that um, in a new thought kind of a, arena, we kind of struggle with this a little bit with, you know, where is it that I take action? Where is it that I just hold the consciousness? And so I came across a couple of quotes, one in particular that I want to share right now. Um, and it's from James Baldwin. He says, it began to seem that one would have to hold in mind forever two ideas which seemed to be in opposition. The first idea was acceptance, the acceptance totally without rancor of life as it is and men as they are. In the light of this idea, it goes without saying that injustice is, com is a commonplace. But this did not mean that one could be complacent, for the second idea was of equal power, that one must never in one's own life accept these injustices as commonplace, but must fight them with all of one's strength. This fight begins, however, in the heart, and it now had been laid to my charge to keep my own heart free of hatred and despair. So it's this kind of a, a, a walk, this um, a balance beam kind of a walk that, that we are taking where we wanna stay connected in our heart space, but we also want to be able to step up and to stand out when it's necessary. Albert Einstein said, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. John Pavlovitz, great um, author, said, we are Christians who have no tolerance for prejudice that denies the inherent worth of a human being based on their identity or gender or pigmentation or orientation or land of origin or faith tradition, especially when it commandeers the name of Jesus to do it. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. said, a man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. And last week we talked about Brene Brown and stepping into the arena and that we are stepping into the arena, that we are gonna make our voices heard. Um, and as we shared last week, when you step into the arena, sometimes you're gonna get your behind kicked, sometimes you're gonna fall, but it's important for us to be in the arena because this message is so needed in our community and in the world um, right now. So I'm tying this in to, uh, to talking about the Christ today. And um, I'm basing most of what I'm sharing with you today on a book by Father Richard Rohr. Uh, he's a Franciscan uh, a priest uh, called The Universal Christ. Now, Paul and I, I turned on Oprah Winfrey, one of her soulful Sundays, and we watched this, and we were so taken with him. And th you know, then we found out about the book, and we ordered the book immediately. And we've read numerous chapters. I've reread numerous chapters and listened on Audible as well, because this book is it's so refreshing. It's so enlightening. It speaks our truth. Um, but it brings the Bible into it in a way that makes the Bible our friend. You know, in unity we see the Bible as uh, the consciousness of our own uh, evolution. And uh, boy, it has just really clarified a lot of scripture for us, and we, we're only through maybe like four chapters of it. Um, it's already, I know, deepened my relationship with my understanding of what the Christ is, as well as helping me to understand further Jesus's 
purpose and really to you know to embrace Jesus and the Christ. Um, Richard and, and I want to tell you this book is about absolute oneness, about absolute inclusivity. No one, nothing is left out, and of course that's our our basic message. So. He says that the essential function of religion is to radically connect us with everything. Religio is to religament or reconnect. Um, so in a lot of ways we see religion that has separated us. But religion was actually created to connect us with everything. Jesus came that they all may be one, John 17, 21. He came to unite and to reconcile all things in himself, everything in heaven and on earth, Colossians 1, 19. So Christ is not Jesus' last name. And he says that is the premise of this book, the recognition of what this Christ is. And it's so beautiful. And I know we talk about this, but for some reason, this book has really just touched us so deeply. And I talked to somebody else who had gotten this book recently and was feeling the same thing. So the, bur the, word, the word used in the Bible for this idea was logos, um, which was taken from Greek philosophy. And he translated it into the blueprint or primordial pattern for reality. He goes on to say that everything that exists in material form is the offspring of some primal source, which originally existed only as spirit. As I said in the meditation, you know, in the beginning God and God's spirit hovered the waters. I, just, I think this is so beautiful. I love how he says this. This infinite primal source somehow poured itself into finite, visible forms, creating everything from rocks to water, plants, organisms, animals, and hum human beings, everything that we see with our eyes, which makes sense, right? I mean, it's all from one source. This self-disclosure of whomever you call God into the physical creation was the first incarnation, that's a term for any enfleshment of spirit, long before the persona, the second incarnation that we believed happened, that was Jesus. So 13.7 billion years ago, this first incarnation, what we would call the word, the Christ, uh, you know, the, as I said, the, you know, the word uh, was with God and the word was God in the beginning, it poured itself into finite form in every single one of us. And what he says here is that the whole of creation, not just Jesus, is the beloved community, the partner in the divine dance. Everything is the child of God. And that's something for us to wrap our mind around because we always say we are a child of God. He's saying everything is a child of God. Everything has God's DNA. In fact, in the foreword in his book, he dedicates his book to his dog, just had just passed away, and he said, the Christ, because the Christ is in everything. Um, he said all creatures in some way carry the, sp the uh, spiritual DNA, the divine DNA of their creator. God is inherent all, in all things. I love how he says this, and this whole thing is going somewhere good. In the beginning, God created, la, 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 and he saw that it was good. And he's like, hold on to that. Because even in times in our own personal lives or with whatever's going on in our country or the world, we can, we can see this as a whole process and know that it is going somewhere good, even when we can't exactly see it yet. Um, so the exclusionary aspect of traditional Christianity is in opposition to what actually is because what actually is is absolute inclusivity. There's nothing and no one left out in this. Um, and what we do know is that Christianity has been at the helm of persecuting women and gays and Jews and uh, people of color and more for centuries and centuries and centuries. When you look back at the history, it's appalling. And it hasn't stopped. And it's time for it to absolutely stop. You know, there have been millions of people who have lost their lives through unjust slaughter, you know, based on um, historical Christianity. And how many people, and we talked about this last week, that have committed suicide based on that narrow, um, in-the-box idea of uh, translation of scripture. And it's got to stop. And it's not gonna stop if we don't speak up. It's not gonna stop if we don't stand up. We've got to be voicing it. We've got to be standing for it. We've got to be living it. We have to show up as that. 
in everything in our lives. I believe that as we move into a deeper understanding um, of our true nature and the, the true nature of everyone else, that when we do see injustices, we will not not be able to do something because we know that as it's done to one, it is done to everyone. As it's done to one, it is done to every single person. And the dehumanizing of anybody is unacceptable. Totally, 100% unacceptable. We are all the body of Christ. So he shares um, a story from, uh, he calls her an English mystic, and he calls a mystic somebody who is able to see in whole rather than in parts. So they're able to see there's a whole picture here, or he's able to see the wholeness of a person. Um, she was a, an English mystic. She was a writer. She was an uh, artist. Her name, Carol Houselander. And in her autobiography, A Rocking Horse Catholic, uh, she tells of a story when she was on a train underground in London and it was a, she had a vision that transformed her life. And he wants to share this experience because he said it poignantly demonstrates what he is calling the Christ mystery. And the Christ mystery is the indwelling presence of the divine presence, I'm sorry, the indwelling of the divine presence in everyone and everything since the beginning of time as we know it not just since 2,000 year, plus years ago, since the beginning of time as we know it. So, here's our story. I was in an underground train, a crowded train, in which all sorts of people jostled together, sitting in strap hanging, workers of every description, getting home at the end of the day. This is like the 1920s. Quite suddenly, I saw with my mind, but as vividly as a wonderful picture, Christ in them all. But I saw more than that. Not only was Christ in every one of them, living in them, dying in them, rejoicing in them, sorrowing in them, but because he was in them and because they were here, the whole world was here too, here in this underground train. And not only the world as it was at that moment, not only all the people in all of the countries in the world, but all those people who had lived in the past and all those yet to come. I came out into the street and walked for a long time in the crowds. It was the same here, on every side and every passerby, everywhere, Christ. I had long been haunted by the Russian conception of the humiliated Christ, the lame Christ limping through Russia, begging his bread, the Christ who all through the ages might return to earth and come even to sinners to win their compassion by his need. Now in the flash of a second, I knew that this dream was a fact, not a dream, not the fantasy or legend of a devout people, not the prerogative of the Russians, but Christ in man. I saw too the reverence that everyone must have for a sinner instead of condoning his sin, which is in reality his utmost sorrow. One must comfort Christ who is suffering in him. I love that. And this reverence must be paid even to those sinners whose souls seem to be dead because it is Christ who is the life of the soul who is dead in them. They are his tombs, and Christ in the tomb is potentially the risen Christ. This gives like a whole new meaning to me of the crucifixion and the resurrection. It's a very personal inside, but when somebody is feeling dead and that Christ is in the tomb, the potential is the risen Christ. Christ is everywhere. In him, every kind of life has a meaning and has an influence on every other kind of life. Realization of our oneness in Christ is the only cure for human loneliness. For me too, it is the only ultimate meaning of life. The only thing that gives meaning and purpose to every life. After a few days, the vision faded. People looked the same again. There was no longer the same shock of insight for me each time I was face to face with another human being. Christ was hidden again. Indeed, through the years to come, I would have to seek for him. And usually I would find him in others and still more in myself only through a deliberate and blind act of faith. So let's look for a moment at some of the phrases that she, that she uses here. Everywhere, Christ, in everybody, from the beginning and eternally. A realization of absolute oneness. Reverence. You know, I loved this because one of the things that he talks about is that, you know, in fundamental Christianity, the whole idea is you want to get to the hereafter. And he said they're missing the point. 
that the, whole, the holiness and the sacredness is now. It's in this present moment. And that we have that opportunity to experience that, that, that holiness and that sacredness in each other, in ourselves, in each other, and in everything around us in this present moment. And it changes, it's life changing to really dive into this and to really start living from that. Every kind of life has meaning. And sometimes that's hard for us to see, isn't it? Because we see some lives that seem like they're, they're not going anywhere. And I loved how he said, and that's the, the suffering of the Christ in them. And our opportunity when we, when we move into this place where we recognize that, that we are the Christ and we can see that suffering in another, we have the opportunity to shine a light on that, to send that love to that Christ in them, that it can help to elevate them. And that every kind of, or every life has an influence on every other kind of life. That is absolute oneness, you guys. <laughs> that is absolute and powerful in its oneness. And he said, who wouldn't want to experience such things? That if Hauslander's vision seems to us today somehow exotic, here's the thing, it wasn't out of, uh, out of the ordinary at all for early Christians. He said that the revelation of the risen Christ is as ubiquitous, which is everywhere um, and in all and eternal, was clearly affirmed in the scriptures, Colossians 1, Ephesians 1, John 1, Hebrews 1, and in the early church, when the euphoria of the Christian faith was still creative and expanding. I don't think it's been creative and expanding for a long time, wouldn't you say? It's been very much in the box. But how beautiful that, you know, this was what was known for, for a long time. And then, you know, we started creating um, these boxes. But he said, we need to start reclaiming this because we've lost this... Um, idea of, of the understanding of God as um, a God that has been liberating and loving everyone and everything. There are no exceptions to this. There's not, you don't have to be saved. God loves us, every single one of us, just as we are, always has, is, does now, and always will. There can, it can never be any other way and every single person. And you know what happened was Christianity gradually limited the divine presence to a single body of Jesus, and part of the problem with that is that um, most of them um, also believe that his divinity is exclusive only to him. And you know, I know that I've had conversations with people that you know, when I say, you know, if I even like say the words, you know, I am, I am the Christ, it's like blasphemer. <laughs> You're going to hell. You know, it's like no, you can't say that. There is none other than Jesus the Christ. And it's like, yeah, we're all that. We always have been, and we always will be. All of this has the the Christ DNA. Paul said in Colossians 3.1, there is only Christ. He is in everything and he is everything. There is only Christ. Now, um, many of you may know um, the story of Paul with his conversion. He was Saul and he had this experience where Jesus came to him and said, you know, why are you persecuting me? Because Paul was persecuting a whole group of people. And he, why are you persecuting me? And Paul was like, and he said it three times, and what Jesus was saying, why are you, when he's saying, why are you persecuting me, why are you persecuting the people? And, it, and Paul said it was like scales came off of his eyes. And from that point on is when he began to see from the Christed view, and he began to speak from that divinity, from that um, divine view, and recognize that Jesus never said, worship me. Jesus said, follow me. He never said worship me, did he? He didn't. He said follow me. Um, and, he, and Richard says we can't overestimate the damage it was done to our gospel uh, message when the Eastern Greek and the Western Latin churches split and we have not known one holy undivided church for over a thousand years. Don't you think it's time <laughs> that we come back to one, you know, oneness and love and compassion and kindness and inclusivity? Uh, but he said that we can open 
reopen that ancient door of faith, and we can, with the key to unlock that is one word, and that is the Christ. So let me share with you some of what he says about the Christ. He said, long before Jesus' personal incarnation, Christ was deeply embedded in all things, as all things. Christ is the light that allows people to see things in their fullness. The precise and intended effect of such a light is to see Christ everywhere else. So we see through the light of the Christ, and we see Christ everywhere else. He says a mature Christian sees Christ in everything and everyone else. This definition will never fail you, always demand more of you, and give you no reasons to fight, exclude, or reject anyone. When the Christ called himself the light of the world, John 8, 12, he is not telling us to look at him, but to look out at life with his all merciful eyes. I love that so much. That we, that, that, cause, because he said, you are also the light. So I am the light of the world, but you are also the light. So look out through those all merciful eyes. We see him so we can see like him and with that same infinite passion. And when your isolated eye turns into a collective we, you have moved from Jesus to Christ. And he said, Jesus can hold together one group of religion, but Christ can hold together everything. Big difference, big difference. Um, so uh, Richard asks these questions, what if Christ is a name for the transcendent within and of everything in the universe? What if Christ is the name for the immense spaciousness of all true love? What if Christ refers to an infinite horizon that pulls us from within and pulls us forward too? And what if Christ is another name for everything in its fullness? And it is. So let's take a moment and look at what our co-founder, Charles Fillmore, says about the Christ in The Revealing Word. He says, the Christ is the incarnating principle of God-man, the perfect word, Logos, or idea of God, which unfolds into the true man and is blessed with eternal life by measuring up to the divine standard, thus fulfilling the law of righteousness. Thou art my beloved son, and thee I am well pleased. He says Christ is the divine man. Jesus is the name that represents an individual expression of the Christ idea. Christ existed long before Jesus. <laughs> Heard that somewhere else, isn't that interesting? <laughs> it was the Christ mind in Jesus that exclaimed, and now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And the indwelling Christ is the Son of God, or spiritual nucleus in every single person. He says all our thoughts must harmonize with this spiritual center before we can bring into expression the divine consciousness. And this is why a time apart, a time of meditation and contemplation where you can open yourself up to harmonizing, you know, open yourself to harmonizing with the Christedness of your beingness. And the Christedness of your beingness is always going to be any qualities that you would attribute to God um, in our way of thinking. Maybe not traditional Christianity, but in our, our way of thinking. Each man has within himself the Christ idea, just as Jesus had, and we must look to the indwelling Christ in order to recognize our sonship, our divine origin, birth, even as did the Savior. And I love the real self is closer than breathing and nearer than hands and feet. And then, of course, it is the kingdom of God in each person. And Jesus talked about the kingdom, and where's the kingdom? It's here, and it's at hand. It's, right, it's, it's, it's here, and it's, and it's right within us. So what this is about, it's owning it when we say that we are the Christ. I know that sometimes when I say, hey, let's all say together, I am the Christ, there's kind of like this, <laughs> can I really say this? What, you know, what does this mean? It's owning it because we are. Um, we are the light of the world. And, and we were told that, and I will share many more scriptures with you probably next week about how scripture absolutely supports what this is about. And we are to remember that it's not just our Christedness, but it's everyone else's and it's everything. And the thing is, is we have to be able to recognize it in ourselves to be able ultimately to see it in others who maybe it's kind of hard to see um, that Christ in them. And we have this ability. Um, 
My friend Dwayne, Dwayne Coppler, many of you know him, sent me an email one day and he said, today as I went to Walmart for a few things, I was thinking about the wonderful experience I had in Naples when Panache Desai had us look into each other's eyes and say, I see you, I see God's love in you, and then I love you. As I walked through Walmart, I began saying those phrases to people I saw. I began thinking them, then started murmuring them under my breath. It was amazing how emotional I became. I intend to do that some more wherever I am. Perhaps this is a way to lift the world to a higher level because we know thoughts, AKA prayers, are effective. And I love that. It's this is how we put you know, we put it into action, is that, you know, when, when we're out somewhere, this is our practice, this is how we can practice, is just a willingness, first an awareness, because we have to wake up and become aware, and most of the time we're not in that awareness, we're just in the world, but we become aware, and we start with, you know, I'm either I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the Christ in you, or even as, as he said, you know, I see you, I see God's love in you, and it may be that, but, it's life changing to do these things. It's life changing. It changes you, but it, it elevates everything. It can't not elevate everything and expand everything because that's what the light does. Um, so I'm gonna invite us, if you would like, to say, I am the Christ. I am the Christ. And I'm, if you just you know, want to put your hand on your heart and just say, I am the Christ. I am the Christ. I am the son or daughter, or may say both, of the living God. I am the daughter of the living God. And you are that. You are that. You are the Christ. That's not too big for you. That's just who you are. We think it's too big because we haven't let ourselves really relate with that. We haven't let ourselves really deep, go deep and, and let ourselves live from that. It's this Christ that, that heals us. It's this Christ that guides us. It's this Christ that, that expands us. It's this Christ that loves through us and that heals the world ultimately. But you and I, we're the ones. We're the ones that are being called to let that light shine and to let it shine brilliantly and to let it shine brightly. I invite you this week to spend some time, and not just this week, because it's a lifelong journey, but in, in some quiet time and contemplation and ask yourself, you know, what does this mean that I am the Christ? Is there anything in me that, that is not, that is like kind of pushing that away? And, and what is that? And you know, how can this show up in my life? How, how, how would I navigate my life today if I really showed up as that Christ presence, as that Christ essence, how would, I, how would I be with the people that I come into contact with? How would I be with people who were maybe showing up in kind of a negative way? Would I be able to see the suffering of the Christ in them? And would I be able to recognize that and send love to them? And here's the thing about it, we have to let go of the outcome. That's not our, that's not our thing. We are just here to presence it, to presence love and to presence light. Um, and not only in people, but in everything. I invite you to start just kind of looking around and just see the Christ in, in everything around you. It is truly life-changing to do this. And I don't know how many weeks we're gonna spend on this, um, but we're gonna spend some more time talking about this book, talking about the truths in it. And I hope that through this journey that we will something will break open in us. Something will be so stirred up in us that we will be different. That we, we will be able to presence love in ways that we haven't been able to up until this point in our lives. Because that's what's gonna change this world is presencing that love. So in closing, I say to you, namaste. I see the divine and the holy, the beautiful, the love, the compassion, the kindness, the goodness, the expansion. I see that God, that Christ loves.